and I'd like to Barnaby Lennon to continue the case for the opposition. <clears throat> well, well, good. <clears throat> good evening, everybody. So, I read the, uh, a, lot, a lot of the newspapers, um, and th the first thing I notice is that all types of school are described as a disaster. Uh, free schools are described as a disaster because they're, uh, <coughs> because many have failed. Grammar schools are described as a disaster because they take very few students from low-income homes. Academies are described as a disaster because they become disconnected from the local community and their chief executives are paid too much. Comprehensives are described as a disaster because they have uh, um, inadequate standards. Faith schools are described as a disaster because there's a tendency to focus on indoctrination, if you like, rather than education. So all types of schools, including private schools, are described as a disaster. And so that leads me to believe that we're in a world here of hyperbole, exaggeration, um, and but this is the heart of this motion. Private schools are a disaster. Now I went to, uh, I was brought up on a council estate in South London. I went to a private school, but it was a direct grant school, which meant that anybody who passed the exam, the local authority paid their fee. Um, and in those days, in the 1970s, they were the best schools in Britain. It's famous schools like Manchester Grammar or King Edward's Birmingham, where 60% of the pupils would have been on free places, pupils from the council estates of those cities. And uh, when I stopped being a headmaster five years ago, I set up a state school in East London the London Academy of Excellence, which is sponsored by six independent schools and is now one of the highest achieving state schools in the country. So I tell you this because it informs where I come from. You can see that with my background and my history, I'm not going to regard independent schools as being a disaster, far from it. Now, I taught at Eton and at Harrow, but I implore you to believe that these schools good as I would say they are, are not typical private schools. The typical private school is quite small, 300 pupils, for children aged 5 to 11, not selective, charitable status, that means it doesn't make any profits, um, but that's what a typical private school actually <coughs> looks like. And the Harrows and the Eatons are part of a very small, although I agree influential, subset. Many uh, private schools specialise in something and they do something that the state doesn't do especially well. They do special needs. A huge number actually. A huge number of special needs schools in this country are private schools. Or they may uh, concentrate on pupils of high ability. I admit there are some of those. Or their boarding schools. Um, which are invaluable to a whole range of types of parents in this country. Or their single-sex schools, which, whether you believe in single-sex schools or not, gives parents choice. Um, their music schools, dance schools, nursery schools, schools which offer qualifications that are not often offered by state schools, like the International Baccalaureate. So many private schools are like this. They're not a disaster, they're a national asset, they're compensating for what is not offered by the state. And in fact, some of those schools, you know, pupils can go with state funding. But they're still <coughs> pri private schools. Now, British private schools are regarded as being amongst the best schools in the world, across the world, and especially outside this country. Uh, when I was headmaster at Harrow, I can't tell you the number of times my PA would knock on my door, headmaster, there's someone on the phone from somewhere like Mauritius who wants you to come and set up a school. Tempting, 
And uh, while I was at that school, I set up three schools abroad, one in Thailand and two in China. And it's a remarkable fact that every head of every private school, senior school anyway, in the country, will have had such a request every month for the past year or two, because our schools are admired so much. And uh, I, I was asked by the Chinese government to set up a school in Hong Kong based on the British private school model. Maybe British private schools are more suited to a communist country, I don't know. But what I do know is that, you know, this evening there are pupils walking around Beijing wearing straw hats with their blue blazers with Harrow written on. Um, and if you ask them, are these schools a disaster, they wouldn't even begin to understand the question. And every year, tens of thousands of children fly to this country despite the distance and the cost and the privations of a British boarding school because they regard these schools as being far better than any in their own country. Would they regard them as being a disaster or is this motion just actually a bit of a joke? <laughs> now, I'm going to say something about social mobility because I think it's a very important issue. Um, there's one thing which is very, very bad about the British education system, and that is the correlation between income and exam results and job prospects. There's no doubt about it that this is a, you know, a serious problem in this country. Now, just a few hundred yards from here, in Nuffield College this evening, is sitting the doyen of sociologists, the world expert on social mobility, John Goldthorpe, and I've read his work, and he's emphatic that the thing which determines social mobility in this country is, surprisingly, I would say, not education. It's all to do with the nature of the economy, and um, the period of greatest social mobility in this country, the 50s and particularly the 60s, social mobility happened because of the decline in manufacturing industry, the growth of white-collar jobs, and the emergence of large numbers of women in the workforce, that produced real social mobility of a sort that we're not seeing at the moment. But you can't blame independent schools for that because independent schools only take 7% of the pupil population and a third of them are on reduced fees. A third of them are on big bursaries. So you're talking about perhaps 4% of all the pupils who come from wealthy backgrounds, getting good results. But then on top of those, as has already been suggested, there are those of you who went to grammar schools where, incidentally, most of you had paid private tuition. And then there are those of you who went to high-achieving sixth form colleges like Hills Road and Peter Simmons that send far more pupils to Oxford than nearly any <coughs> private school. And then there are those of you who went to high-achieving academies or high-achieving comprehensive schools with the high land prices and your parents read to you from an early age and you pretended to be a member of the Church of England so you could get into a good primary school. <laughs> um, but, and then at the other end of the spectrum are the more disadvantaged. And in this room there'll be a small number of you, but it's difficult because your parents didn't read to you when you were young, they didn't speak to you in the same way as a middle-class parent did, and so you started at primary school two years behind the average, and it's very difficult to catch up. Now, that is a description of the problem that British education faces, but it's not down to this tiny number who went to independent schools. A third of our pupils at independent schools are on bursaries. I was the headmaster of a school in Croydon, one of the Whitgift Foundation schools, and um, nearly half of my pupils were on bursaries and a quarter were on free places. And the three Whitgift Foundation schools and the three Allains Foundation, Dulwich and so on, those schools are integral to the academic success of South London, which is not altogether a rich area. Um, and without those schools, I promise you, that area would struggle. So, 
I looked the other day at the uh, Ox Oxford University's um, access agreement through what, of course, has until recently been the Office for Fair Access, now the Office for Students. A third of the pupils at Oxford on Oxford University hardship bursaries were at private schools. It's an extraordinary figure. So those are pupils who were on bursaries at my schools and now have come here. But it's their family background that has, of course, given them access to these bursaries. Social mobility isn't, isn't only about class, of course, it's also about gender. And I hope that all the women here this evening will recognise the fact that one of the only reasons you're here, actually, is because academic education for girls was pioneered by private schools. Um, schools like the great Girls' Day School Trust schools, which some of you went to, um, with their relatively low fees, pioneered by women like the, the spinsters Miss Buss and Miss Beale, who founded my daughter's school, North London Collegiate. And the girls sang, Miss Buss and Miss Beale, Cupid's darts did not feel. How different from us, Miss Beale and Miss Buss. Social mobility. And also, in terms of ethnicity, social mobility is also to do with ethnicity. And if you go to the private schools, particularly in the big cities like London and Birmingham and the North, well over half the pupils there are non-white. And they are the ladder to social mobility that those children's parents and grandparents hoped for when they came to this country. Well, we have a strange obsession in this, uh, in this country with private and public but all I would say is here we are in Oxford, a privately owned charitable organisation, originally paid for by private individuals, not the state, charging fees and offering bursaries to those who need it. So before you're too snooty about private schools, remember where you are. And finally, the thing I really dislike about, about this uh, motion is the fact that it's putting private schools on some sort of pinnacle as being the big problem. But there, you know, there is a big problem. There is a huge problem in this country, and that is the terrible underachievement of the bottom 30%, particularly boys, where we do far worse they are, they're on the whole, they don't seem to learn anything after the age of 11. And then, on top of that, we provide an absolutely dire alternative to university. You know, we've been struggling with vocational education in this country since 1860, and it's still disastrous. That's, the, that's what we mean when we talk about a disaster. So please, don't characterise this small problem which relates to private schools, when we have something far more serious to talk about. Now, I realise that there are all sorts of groups overrepresented at Oxford. I'm sorry that independent schools are overrepresented here, but so are middle class pupils from these good comprehensives, pupils from grammar schools, white and Asian pupils, women in some subjects, men in others, um, students who live in Surrey. <laughs> You know that Surrey sent as many pupils to Oxford last year as the whole of the northeast of England and Wales combined. <laughs> so they're privileged. Now I expect most of you, you're like me. When you think about this motion, you might think, well, I don't much like private schools at one end of the spectrum. Or you might say, well, I quite like private schools. I think they're, they're pretty good. That's fair. But none of you can vote for this motion because this is about people who think, that they're a disaster. And I would have thought, given that you're an intelligent and reasonable audience, that the number of people who think they're a disaster could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Thank you. Thank you.